So rather than caring so much about what your diagnosis is, we are much more concerned about why are you not feeling well and how do we fix that. So we really look at the body in these core systems and address those systems. And just to give an example, for instance, if you talk about digestive health, you can have IBS, you can have IBD, you can have a little constipation, you can get some diarrhea, right? There's like heartburn, GERD, all these things that fall into the digestive tract. And we could put labels on a lot of things, but functional medicine really looks and says, what's the underlying digestive concern and how do we fix it? And 99.9% .9 of the time, this is done without prescriptions. This is done through diet, lifestyle, and supplemental or herbal use. So um, from that functional medicine standpoint and looking at the body as a whole is kind of what led me then to further um, specialize into hormone health. Um, there's big connections between digestive tract, detoxification, and hormones, which most people are not aware, with, uh, aware of. And you'll see here as we go through this that actually hormones are all interconnected. So it's not just that estrogen and progesterone, it's not just the testosterone by itself, it's not just your insulin somewhere over here, it's everything that is connected as, as really one system. And often they're playing off of each other. Um, I am here on behalf of Natural Health International, which is um, some of the products that we'll be talking about tonight. Um, and just to give you a little bit of an overview when it comes to Natural Health International, and one of the things that drew me towards the company, first and foremost, disclosure, I used the product long before I was with the company, so I have both personal experience as well as clinical experience with it. Um, but one of the things that impressed me the most was there was about 12 years of research that was done in the world of maca before a product ever hit the shelf. And this is really abnormal in the nutraceutical world, right? There's, there's of course, a lot of loose regulations when it comes to supplements. So the fact of having that type of research behind a product before actually allowing somebody to use it is very impressive as, as I was concerned as a clinician. Um, some of the things about natural health, I'll just briefly go over these so we can jump into hormones. Um, from a company standpoint, some of the things that we look at, of course, are results, which is hence why we did 12 years of research before we put anything out there. We wanted to make sure the results were there, and they are. Um, some other things with the science, needless to say, this corresponds as well, right? It's really do, doing a lot of the research and digging in on clinical trials to make sure the science is there to back those claims up. Um, culturally, uh, we look at things like the purity of our, of our supplements, making sure things that are important to everybody, like gluten-free and vegan and USDA organic, all of these types of things to make sure you're getting a quality product. And one of the really neat things, if you go to our website, you can actually see the video um, that gives a little overview about how we actually grow and harvest and manufacture the maca in Peru. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about it, but this just gives you a little idea um, from a cultural and environmental quality standpoint. It's something that is very, very important to us and really stand by making sure that quality is going into this because, again, science behind it, we need to have consistent results. Um, of course, this is our, our medical team, which I personally think we have one of the best medical teams on the planet, but I suppose I'm partial because I am part of this team. Um, but we do um, all work together um, for various educational purposes as well as um, everyone has their specialty in terms of clinical or research um, and education. So we all work together to really help um, from a community aspect in, in this regard. Um, so let's get into the hormones, right? So everybody's here because they're heard of hormones. They're probably having some issues with hormones or their loved one is having some issues with hormones. But a lot of times we tend to um, think about just hormones in terms of, I'll say, PMS or hot flashes, right? But hormones is a much bigger picture. So when we think about hormones, a few of them, we'll talk about estrogen to start off with. Um, most people don't realize that estrogen is kind of a, a broad term, right? So there's actually three estrogens. I'm too close, I don't even need the pointer. <laughs> um, there's actually three different estrogens um, that the body makes. Estrone, 
Um, and this is really easy to remember. Estrone has one estradiol for two and estriol for three. There's your three estrogens. And when we're looking at it, estrone is the most abundant that we have. Estradiol is your most active or your most potent estrogen. And then estriol is our most protective. So you need all of those estrogens. It's just a matter of having them in the right ratios, making sure they're working together properly, and they're not fluctuating all over the place, which is what causes all those symptoms that you're probably concerned about, <laughs> okay? Progesterone is often correlated or thought about when it comes to estrogen as well, because the two basically um, are the two most known in terms of regulating a menstrual cycle. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in just a little bit. And then we have testosterone. So these are really our reproductive hormones. And I have a new slash for everybody, men or women, you have all of them. It's a matter of having it in the right ratio. So men, you have estrogen, so there is a little bit of feminist in you, just a little. Women, you have testosterone, so there's a little manliness in you, right? And it's about having the right balance. To give an example, if a woman has too much testosterone, they may present with more male-like patterns. And what do I mean by that? They might have excess facial hair. They might have a bit more of an anger issue because of the test. I see this guy laughing over here. <laughs> There's a little bit more of an anger because men are a little bit more, you know, they got that little bit more fight in them, right? So these are some examples of just where an imbalance can take place. We don't want to get rid of any of them, and we don't want to have too much of them, right? It's about balance for what's right for us male versus female. Um, we also talk about hormones in terms of thyroid, um, and one area here um, that most people, who's had, everyone's had their thyroid checked? Yes. You had your TSH checked, right? <coughs> Did anybody have their T4 or T3 checked? Oh, I see some yeses and some I'm not really sure, maybe. Thyroid antibodies? No, and some yeses. So just as a brief overview, the thyroid actually makes um, a couple different hormones, T4 and T3. But a lot of times what happens is you get your thyroid checked through uh, a common test called the TSH, and that really just indicates that your pituitary is talking to your thyroid. That's it. It has no indication whatsoever if the thyroid is actually making T4 or T3, or if it's doing it effectively, efficiently, etc. So if you're having just TSH checked, for me, as a clinician, I would say, I have no idea what your thyroid's doing. That does not give me enough information one way or another to make any sort of recommendation. So the very minimal, take, take down note of the T4 and T3 and make sure those are checked, but you should also have your thyroid antibodies looked at. Anybody here Hashimoto's? Thyroiditis? No? Yes? A few in between. So you'll never know about Hashimoto's if the antibodies aren't checked. And a lot of people are walking around symptomatic with low functioning thyroid because the root of the issue is actual antibodies being produced. So big picture when it comes to the thyroid. That's a whole nother class. That's like a whole nother three hour class. You just got three minutes. <laughs> now we have the other big one, the adrenals. Um, anybody have stress? Right? <laughs> Please, right? I mean, we all have that, right? Our adrenal glands is what's really helping us deal with stress. So everybody's had some sort of moment in life where their adrenaline has kicked in, right? You had to run away from somebody, you had to get, you know, a kid from under the car or you know, something crazy like that, right? And then we have cortisol, which is kind of the bigger problem. So adrenaline is that quick hurry up, get out of danger, run from the fire type of, of stress response. But cortisol is that one that will just keep creeping out because you're stressed about your boss. And your husband didn't take the porch like he said he was going to. And your, your wife, you know, came home and yelled at you about something. And the kids have to go to 20 different places. And you have a deadline. And the car broke down. And the, right? This is that constant everyday stress where cortisol keeps like flooding the system. And essentially what starts to happen is your body really 
can't differentiate between what's real stress, what's real danger, and what's that perceived danger, right? Is it, do you need to get out of the way because there's a fire in the house, or you're really ticked off at your boss, right? It's hard for the body to differentiate between those two types of stresses. So ultimately what can happen is your adrenals can get really tired and adrenal fatigue can kick in. But again, all of this is connected and we'll see in a minute just how the connection comes into play. And then insulin. Insulin is a hormone that we just tend to think of, oh, well, you got diabetes, right? Insulin, diabetes, blood sugar's off. Well, guess what? Again, all working together, and very commonly when insulin is off, women can present with things like PCOS, which we tend to think of as a reproductive issue. If your melatonin is off and you're not sleeping, do you think it might have some effect on your adrenal glands as being stressed out, right? And then you feel tired, so you blame it on your thyroid. And then you're stressed out because you're tired and have no energy, and so you get hot flashes or PMS. And then you're angry and moody, and so your adrenals are more stressed out, causing you not to sleep more, causing you to crave sugar. Starting to see the picture? Right? All interconnected. So this is what we're talking about um, and when we start putting this together. Very commonly, it's known as the HPA access, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access. This is the basic of how the body's getting the message. The brain telling your body what to do. In functional medicine, we look at it a little differently and just take it a step further. So it's the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, thyroid, gonad, access. So if we go back, it's addressing all of this. It's looking at how everything is interconnected here. So the adrenal glands, remember stress, Thyroid glands, we talked about the T4, T3. The gonads is your estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So what I can't do here, what I'd love to do, is if I'm in a place that has have like old school chalkboards, <laughs> I like to draw on them for the very simple visual of what happens. This is kind of going in order of importance in a sense that if you are stressed out, it's going to impact your thyroid. So you might go to the doctor saying, I'm feeling tired. I'm having a hard time losing weight. I'm cold all the time, right? And then what happens? What's happening with the thyroid starts to affect the gonads. So now what? Maybe you have your regular cycles. PMS has gotten worse. Hot flashes and night sweats are increasing, which does what? Causes more stress which influences the thyroid, that comes back to here, that causes more stress, that comes back. Feel it? All connected. So one of the underlying things here, of course, is stress. And I know everyone's saying, like, it's okay, Kim, but I have stress, and it's not going to disappear. I get it, right? Stress is not going to disappear, but our response to it can change. And that's the really important piece because taking some time right here can really influence what happens downstream. Make sense? So this is what we really know is the endocrine system. It's just maybe never been explained to you in this way. You go to an endocrinologist, possibly, and maybe they're only looking at your insulin levels. Or maybe they're looking at everything, but they're just not pulling the whole puzzle together. So this is how it all works. You have all of these organs working in unison together. And what happens in one affects the other. So if you kind of picture it, like imagine we were all on stage right now and we're gonna do a beautiful dance together. <laughs> that just went horribly wrong, didn't it? <laughs> so we're all in sync and we're all doing wonderful and somebody got the beat wrong. And then the person next to them got the beat wrong. And then it starts going one by one, the beat wrong, right? So instead of this beautiful dance, now all of a sudden everybody is doing their own thing and it looks like a disaster. Are you with me? That's what happens when hormones get out of whack, which is why you feel like you're walking a disaster a lot of times. 
because that's literally almost what's happening inside your body. It's like, I don't know what to do. Do I need more? Do I need less? Should I increase this? Should I decrease it? Do you want to sleep? Do you want to stay up? I don't know. You told me eat sugar, so that means you must want to stay up. And you had coffee, so I'm super energized, but it's bedtime. Right? I'm confused. That's what's going on when hormones are in balance. Starting to make a little sense there just from the basics. This is really complicated, but I put it up here just to confuse you. No, not really. I put it up here just to help with an appreciation. So I know it's a little hard to see, but what I want you to take from this and to appreciate from this is the interconnectedness of everything. Okay? Who, ha well, you don't have to raise your hands, but for anybody who has elevated cholesterol, and we're worried about heart concern because we've made cholesterol all evil, which it's not. But we've made it to become an all evil thing and this predictor of heart disease, which it's really not. It's about a 50-50 shot, just so you know. 50% of people who have a heart event have high cholesterol and 50% do not. So flip the coin. What I want to just point out is up here, this is what this is. This is cholesterol, okay? So we need cholesterol to then make, this is progesterone. Here's cortisol, stress hormone. Here's testosterone. Here's your estrogens. Interconnected. One piece I really want to point out too is that progesterone, you can see it's way up here, right, in this whole pathway. So we need this level of progesterone in order to get through the pathways to get testosterone and in order for it to be metabolized or, or made in, into estrogens. But what happens here, this is known as the cortisol steal. Anybody hear that term before? I got one person. Pretty good. Now everyone will know about this. Cortisol steal. What happens is, what do you think your body's more concerned with? Reproducing or getting you out of danger? Of course, the body is going to say, we need to get you out of danger. I don't care about you reproducing as much as I care about getting you out of danger. So it's known as the cortisol steal. We're going back to that HPATG access, right? If you are stressed, the energy or focus is going to go here. The body becomes less concerned about your testosterone and estrogen. So if your estrogen's dropping, if your testosterone's dropping, we do have to kind of backstream and say, what's going on from a stress piece? If you have low progesterone, is it because it's all getting used up to maintain the high stress that's going on in life? All right, so just, I did this to really just kind of create the big picture to really see. I personally think this is beautifully complex and it helps to really appreciate your body does have a lot going on and we shouldn't like just put it into this hole of, oh, well you have diabetes, you know, here's metformin and be on your way. Eat better, by the way, and exercise. Right? It's so, it's so much bigger than that. There's so much more going on in the human body than that. So it really comes down to balance. And so we're going to take some time talking about how to get the body in balance. And obviously, I think most of you now know why that would be important. Right? So just to talk a little bit about the fact of why we know so much about maca, I kind of alluded to this already. We did many, many years of research before bringing the product onto the market. If you look up in PubMed, if you're just bored one day and want to do some research, um, you can find that on MACA, basically Dr. Meisner and Dr. Gonzalez, I don't know exactly, but I'm willing to say there's somewhere probably in the 70, 60, 70 percent of all research on MACA is done by these two gentlemen and their teams. So we know quite a bit about MACA. And it just so happens that Dr. MACA, is, uh, Dr. MACA, <laughs> he is kind of Dr. MACA, Dr. Meisner, is also part of our medical board. So we um, definitely get all the greatest and latest research that comes out of him um, in applying it to our product. So everybody from, have you all heard of maca before? I don't want to make any assumptions. Some, no, some are and some aren't. So maca, this is what you're looking at right here. Maca kind of looks a little bit like a turnip or potato. Um, it is grown in the mountains of Peru. Uh, it is eaten as a food source there. Uh, they've long known about all the great beneficial properties to maca, um, but not necessarily to the degree that we actually know now. Of course, now that a lot more studying is going on uh, in terms of maca. 
We do know that there's 13 different phenotypes, and this, I, I have to say, is one of the biggest uh, features or biggest uh, ahas to know, you know, absolute musk when we're talking about maca. Um, because not all maca is the same. It's not all created equal. So just because you see maca somewhere does not mean it's the same thing as what you're, we're, excuse me, what we're going to be talking about with the products here at NHI. 13 different phenotypes. We know their DNA is different. We know their analytical profiles are different. And we know that the response it creates in the body is also different. So some phenotypes are really good for, say, prostate health. Some are good for sperm motility. Some are good for bone health. Some are good for hot flashes, right? So if you just grab a maca and don't really know what the phenotype is, and you're a woman and you take the one that's really good for prostate, is it going to work for you? Probably not. You're going to come in and say, hey, this didn't work, right? Or I didn't feel any different on this. Um, I have actually seen as part of the medical team, women in particular who have gotten worse taking some maca products because it was geared towards male hormone health and they already had PCOS. So their levels of testosterone were already too high and now it was just encouraging it to be even higher so they felt worse. Right, so choosing the right one is really important and the research is there to um, really support why, why they're different. Um, as a company, we have a very small product line and it's designed this way to be very specific and supportive together. Um, our CEO, James Frame, he always basically makes a comment, something along, he'll kind of pick whatever supplement he's on a kick with, but um, he never wants to be like, oh, I'm the third best maca product on the market, <laughs> right? When he puts something out, he wants to be the best at what we do. And so we've kept things very concise and, and, um, and specific, so everything is working really well together. So we're going to touch on all of these. First and foremost, we're going to be talking about women, and sorry men, but most of the talk is about women. <laughs> You'll get yours too, but there is a bigger focus on women when it comes to this because we have three different products for women. So Feminescence is our female uh, line. All of Maka, I should let you know, is, an, is considered an adaptogen. Has anybody heard that term before? Yes and no. Okay. So adaptogens, basically the name implies it. So an adaptogen does just that. It adapts. Right? So if your body needs to make more, then it encourages the body to make more. And if it needs to damper down and make less, then it encourages it to make less, and if it's really happy where it is, then it adapts and says, hey, this is cool, we're going to maintain this. So adaptogens are very unique in this aspect, and maca does get classified into this. Some other adaptogens you might be familiar with, things like ginseng, ashwagandha, rhodiola, if you've heard some of these before, they are also adaptogens, so they're able to work with what your body needs. So it really is, what's the feedback that's coming through that HPA access to say, do I need more estrogen? Do I need to damper it down a little? Do I need more testosterone or do I need to damper it down a little? And so it's really working with the feedback in your body versus, just to point out, a stimulant, right? So what's a, everybody's familiar with a stimulant, right? Coffee is a stimulant, right? And what's the idea is like, give you that big rush, but then what happens? Crash down, right? Adaptogens don't, we, we, don't, we don't go that way, right? We don't have that sudden burn and crash. There is some confusion because sometimes you'll see that maca can be stimulating. So then people go, oh, it's a stimulant. I don't want to take it. Stimulating is different than a stimulant, okay? So maca can both be stimulating and relaxing. Why? It depends. What do you need? What does the body need to adapt to? Do we need to stimulate it so you get maybe some more energy? Or do we need to bring you down so you can go to sleep at night? Make sense? So is there a genetic element associated with the use of any adaptogen? A genetic aspect of the herb or the person? Well, the person who's taking that. Well, yeah, so genetics always play a role, period, no sure. matter what. So some people are going to be more genetically disposed to have certain characteristics, if you will. Right. I mean, as far as things like stimulants are concerned, for example, if you can use meditation, 
telling them to go to GABA um, at certain times uh, make them want to exercise because they're actually stimulating certain pathways in people who have specific genetics that allow that to happen. Right. And I would imagine this is very much the same thing. Right. So when you get into on, on that level, of course, ultimately we're really at the cost from a genetic standpoint and really understanding how all the various nutrients are impacting all the various pathways. Right. But to go back to just the basics of the adaptogen being able to work with the ups or downs, what does your personal body need? What is that HPA access telling you, basically? And how is it supporting in that fashion? So what you need can be very different from what I need, but this is also all programmed within my body versus your body. Right, then I would use labs to determine why or how my body is responding relative to something like adaptogen. You can. Yes. Yes, you absolutely can. Um, I'm a big believer in there's a lot of labs for a lot of things, but I also tend to look at how do you feel. Yeah, sure. So right? Like yeah. Because, and, and to be fair, I, I've had many people come in that say my labs are normal, but I feel like garbage. So, okay, great, you got normal labs, good for you, but you still feel horrible, which is then what's going on and listening to the body. So, you've got to work it all together. Yeah, you've got to work it all together for sure. Big picture. Um, some of the things when it comes to feminescence versus, versus other maca, um, and this is information that gets into a little bit on the research standpoint. Um, so very, very much using specific phenotypes for feminescence. We use a, a blend that's known as maca -Geo. Um The research articles are all posted on PubMed for anybody to see as well as our website. So you can see all the clinical trials that were done. Um, it is a proprietary blend, so I can't tell you what's in it. I'll be honest, I don't know what the ratio is of the blend that's in it. Hence proprietary, right? So. Um, there's probably maybe two people in the whole company, and I'm assuming the CEO and Dr. Meisner are probably the only two that actually know the, the ratios of that. But it is that particular blend that's really geared toward each stage of life to basically help with um, symptomology from an 84% success rate, which is really fantastic in the, in the nutraceutical world. Um, some other um, maca products, about a 60% success rate, um, on average, I forget the exact numbers, but I want to say on average, the average drug is around a 20% to 30% success rate, and I might be generous with that, depending on the drug. Um, so to compare from a standpoint of just effectiveness, is it going to work 100% for everybody? No, nothing does, right? I mean, there's, there's always going to be some little quirks, but an 84% success rate is, is quite significant. Um, we did look, and this is a really, really important piece when it comes to feminescence, um, is the fact that it did have an impact on hormone levels. So this is not just about covering up the symptom. It's not what it's about. It's really impacting hormone levels. So for instance, in our studies, which I'll talk a little bit about with postmenopausal women, where estradiol levels are typically low, that's what starts to decrease in perimenopause and in the menopause. An increase in estradiol was seen. This helps to create a little bit more natural balance so you're not having symptomology. So one of the, the really nice things about this is the fact that at this point anyway, at this moment in time, this is the only natural product that actually has an impact on female hormones, not just the symptoms. You get the symptom relief as well, but you're actually influencing your hormones. So this is something, if you were to do a lab, you would see fluctuations and changes take place in your hormone levels. Um, we did also look, and I'll go, yes? Then in that case, are there any CV correlation to increase certain uh, gynecological cancers? Good question. No, so I don't know if everybody heard that, but wondering about the increase of certain cancers, for instance, like a breast cancer. Um, one of the neat things, remember just going back to the adaptogenic aspect, so we did see after actually a 12-week 12, uh, 12 time period that hormones, once they're, they're balanced, plateau and maintain the balance. So we don't want the risk of, of elevating hormones above what's normal, which is really important for, for people who are concerned about that. So that was a lab test? That was in our clinical trials. Okay. Yep. Um, we did also look at things like bone density and heart health, um, which I'll go into just a little, in just a little bit, because we know the connections with bone and, and heart, as well as mental health when it comes to hormones. 
So we um, just a, a review in terms of who's talking about us. Delicious Living we did um, in 2012, but it also just in the beginning of this year won their um, best female um, product, which we were really happy to hear. Um, a lot of talk about in various books. The most recent, if I pick up Kelly Brogan's book, The Mind of Your Own, she speaks of feminescence in that. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of good stuff going on out there. Anybody want to take a guess at how pretty, well, you can see how pretty this is. Anybody want to take a guess at what that is? Come on, somebody yell out something. I need a water break. What? Is it what? Is it maca? No. It does look like a butterfly. It does look like feathers. Petals. <laughs> I think I heard it. Any of your pituitary glands sitting at your hormones? Is that estrogen? Um, you're on the right path. It looks like a hormone. This is what estrogen looks like when it's magnified. Wow. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Isn't that cool? I mean, look how pretty that is. And we, we like villainize estrogen, right? It's so pretty. It is. That's right. We are pretty. This is what makes us pretty because it's pretty. <laughs> we just found sin. Right. Oh. oh boy. <laughs> you will. After after everyone's using feminine, you'll see the beauty come out. <laughs> so yeah, that's what estrogen looks like. It's kind of cool. So guess what? You see it within packaging. We did that specifically. Look at your butterfly. That's where that's kind of what estrogen looks like. Right? What was that? Yeah, kind of. Well, now that you know that that's what it is, I mean, you didn't know before, it just looked like butterfly before, but now you see how pretty it is. So we're going to talk about each of the, there's three different products for women, and it's geared towards stage of life. So Feminescence Maka Harmony is for your reproductive years, Feminescence Maka Life is for perimenopause, and Feminescence Maka Pause is for your postmenopausal women. So usually that's kind of like, well, where am I? What do I fall? Like, okay, a 25-year-old knows that, hey, I'm still here in the reproductive age. But let's say you're 43. Are you in reproductive or are you perimenopausal? Perimenopausal. You want to still be reproductive? Don't know. Really? Don't really know. The average age of perimenopause is 42, but... Somebody said, what if you want to have a baby at 45? Well, if you want to have a baby at 45, we need to support you like you're ready to have a baby. Right? Which would then be feminescence mock of harmony. So some of it is looking at what your ultimate goals are, what you're experiencing, and choosing then the right product. The only, well, not the only, reproductive at younger ages is really clear. And then the feminescence mock of pause is also really clear because menopause is defined as 12 consecutive months without a cycle. Many people are not aware of this. A lot of times we use a term of going through menopause. Well, that just kind of means you're probably in perimenopause, getting ready for that. But once you've been 12 consecutive months without a cycle, that is the medical definition of menopause. With one exception. If you have a hysterectomy, you're immediately placed into menopause. Okay? In which case then, the feminescence menopause is still the, the right product. So this is not age dependent. We have some averages, but it really is looking at what stage of life are you in. And just so you know, in perimenopause in particular, because this kind of creates the most confusion for women, it's a period of time, seven to 10 years, seven to 12 years. It's a stage of life. The key is that you don't have to be suffering through that stage of life, which many women do unnecessarily, for sure. So let's talk about Feminescence Maga Harmony first, which is your reproductive years. Um, and first, just to illustrate what is normal. Many people are not aware of what is normal for hormone fluctuations. This is a normal 28-day cycle. Okay, so just to illustrate, up here we have what's going on in the uterus. Here we have your ovaries and the release of the egg. And here are your hormone levels. You can see the red is your estrogen, blue is progesterone. Do they look like they're balanced? Not necessarily, right? But this is what normal balance is, right? So when somebody says my hormones aren't balanced, well, 
you're right. <laughs> they're not really, they're not meant to stay static. They are meant to be moving throughout the 28 day cycle to support what's truly going on in the body. So what you see here, and this corresponds with, with all three correspond together. So we're talking day one, well, day zero, which never makes any sense to me, it's really day one of the menstrual cycle, is the first day of bleeding. Okay, so what do you see? What's, what's happening? Your, your uterine lining is breaking down. This is the shedding of the lining, which is causing the bleeding. Okay, so around day five, three to five days is quite normal. And you see estrogen is here. What happens is the uterine lining starts to thicken back up again. Estrogen's kind of going along with that. Day 14, what happens here is ovulation around day 14. Ovulation when the egg is released from the ovary, and that happens because there's this massive spike in estrogen. That's normal. That should be happening then to help release the egg from the ovary. And then it drops back down after ovulation, and you see how progesterone then picks up? And then it remains higher than it was, of course, the first about 14 days of the cycle. And progesterone is there to help maintain the integrity of the uterine wall so the egg can actually fertilize and implant into the uterus. This is normal. Most people don't know this. They have no clue about this. And there can be many reasons that this is off. Some people like to use the term estrogen dominance. Anybody get that one? Hear that? No? Estrogen dominance, maybe. You might be estrogen dominant, but you might just be progesterone deficient, making you appear as if you have too much estrogen. Right? But then it's also, what day are we looking at? If you ever have testing done of your hormones and you don't know what day of your cycle you had it done, kind of useless. If you had it day 14, I would expect your estrogen to be higher. That's normal. Right? So just looking at this is what's normal and this is what we want to create to have a normal balance. What happens when you're not in balance? Where do you want me to start? Right? Anybody have PMS? Bloating, headache, cramps, moodiness, change in sleep change of bowel habits. I mean, you know, we can go on and on and on, right? PCOS is an imbalance. Fertility concerns, an imbalance. Um, amenorrhea, a lot of, I don't know, well, I have theories, but that's a whole other class. There's a lot of reasons for amenorrhea at this point, but a lot of women are really walking around with this now. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, the excess exercise for sure is a, is a problem for some women. You know, the elites, the training, the people, a, a lot of the athletes that don't get their cycles as a result. But there's so many reasons for this, and ultimately what we want to get back to is this normal balance. So that's where feminescence, maka, harmony is coming into play for women in their reproductive years. Now this, all of the feminescence use maka geo, that proprietary blend I, excuse me, that I talked about, however, it also contains maca phenotypes that are specific for the healthy menstrual cycle and healthy egg quality. So again, very important for those women who are in that stage of life. Feminescence maca life, your perimenopausal women. Again, when is this happening? Hard to say exactly, but some defining pieces that may present that you never saw before would be something like a little hot flash going on. Maybe some night sweats along with it. Never had those before. Maybe you have some change in libido, change in sleep patterns. Your cycle becomes irregular. So maybe it went from every 28 days to every 24, every 21. Maybe it was, used to be three days, now it's five. Used to be five days, now it's two. Used to be really heavy, now it's light. Used to be light, now it's heavy. Like all kinds of fluctuations go on during this time frame of life. And keep in mind that that stage of life is really, it's just that, it's a stage. It can go on for many years, but the key here is that there's an imbalance that's taking place that needs to be addressed. So feminescence maca life is designed for that. We did independent studies on feminescence maca life as well looking at some of those key symptoms that women are having um, in terms of hot flashes, night sweats, changes in libido, those things that I spoke about, 
and between a 74 and 82 percent reduction in symptoms which again is pretty substantial um, and again helping to support things like bone and heart health which I am getting to that I promise this is some of the um, information from our clinical trials, just looking at things like estradiol. Um, we did see reductions in body weight. I always hesitate to put this up, but yes, you can have a reduction in body weight when it is hormonally related, okay? A lot of women in perimenopause tend to see, hey, I'm gaining some weight, I'm having trouble losing it. It could be from hormones, but it can be from other things too. So you never wanna dismiss that. This is not a weight loss product. And I don't promote it as a weight loss product, but when your hormones are balanced, part of what the body is always trying to do is balance everything, which includes weight as well. So we did see weight loss, and it was typically after two to three months of use um, that we did see that take place. Feminescence marker pause. This is your postmenopausal women, just again to relates to anybody who's had a hysterectomy because they've been surgically placed into menopause. Um, and this just kind of sums it up. I bet you fall into one of those, maybe, right? <laughs> or many, depending on the severity, right? So a lot of symptoms that happen postmenopausally are very similar to that of perimenopause, which I think is why women tend to feel like I'm going through menopause. Right, the symptoms are the same. The defining factor is the menstrual cycle. Perimenopause, you're still having a cycle no matter how erratic and irrational it might be at times. Versus menopause, you're done. That's what it is, menopause. Men the menses has paused, it, it stopped. So that's really the, de the defining piece is the cycle, but the symptoms definitely can be the same. Again, this is looking at the, from the research standpoint, we looked at a three, four, and eight month duration. And this is where I said we saw that plateau. Once hormones balanced, we saw the plateauing effect, so it basically helped to maintain balance. Again, just to go back to the basics of how an adaptogenic you know, substance or herb works, is that's what it's about, is maintaining that balance. Um, definitely we have a lot of various publications um, that this is seen in. The biggest one is it's all made available on PubMed. So anybody can go on PubMed and search it, including all of the doctors out there, which that doesn't happen too often, but if anybody wants to know, it's there. <laughs> Maka G-O is what you'd be looking for on PubMed. And again, some of the other um, results, the feminescence in the purple is seeing an increase, oops, seeing an increase in your estradiol levels, decreases in FSH level. This is typically the one marker that a lot of physicians will run to see or to classify if you're in menopause along with the cycle is that there's this increase in FSH, but again, we're not, this is about working with the body. So we're not trying to make somebody who's in menopause be like they're 20 again in their reproductive years. That's not natural, right? But we just want to support a more balanced effort so you don't have all of these symptoms um, that, that can be presenting as a result. We did also um, measure all the symptoms against something called the Cooperman's um, Metapausal Index, which is where we saw the 84% reduction in symptoms. And this basically is a very lengthy questionnaire that covers just about all of the you know, hundreds of symptoms that can present from a hormonal imbalance. And you don't have to have hot flashes to be perimenopausal or postmenopausal. That's one symptom. You may not get night sweats. You may not get symptoms at all. When you don't have symptoms at all, it means you're balanced. And anybody ever like go through, you know, depending on your age group, you know, if you're in the reproductive years and you get your cycle and you're like, oh man, it's here. Anybody? No? That's how it's supposed to be. Right? You shouldn't be like, oh, crazy moody, where's the chocolate? I can't stand you. You know, give me just something, get out of my hair. Not, no. You should basically wake up and go, oh, oh, it's here. Okay. No indication unless you have a calendar. Menopause. You're not supposed to get hot flashes and night sweats and low libido and crazy changes in sleep. It's a symptom of an imbalance. It's the body really trying to say, hey, something's not right. Right? And there are, I, I don't want to discourage you with this. Back there. <laughs> don't want to discourage you, but there are women who 
who just transition very beautifully and never have an issue. And I know you probably want to just punch them all, but <laughs> that, that's the truth. <laughs> what was that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the truth, is that when it's balanced, you don't present with symptoms. So, um, we did, as I mentioned, looked at some of the cardiovascular markers, because remember that slide I showed you where cholesterol was associated, right? So we looked at cholesterol, because what's going on? What impacts can we have on this, knowing that hormones are balanced? So we saw increases in HDL, which is commonly called your good cholesterol, and decreases in LDL levels. So this is, can be protective from the heart. Estrogen is really cardioprotective, which is why women tend to see increases in cardiovascular disease in their post and peri, or peri and postmenopausal years. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna just drop, excuse me, drop dead of a heart attack. It just means your hormones change, right? So looking at those two levels, we also looked again at, at the body weight and triglyceride levels triglycerides also decreasing over the three month time period. So it's that interconnectedness, right? It's that web of how the body is all interconnected and not these individual symptoms. You know, it's the, it's the body all working together. Um, we did also look at mental health, and this was more from a, excuse me, from a standpoint of symptomology. Um, we do know the effects that um, basically they're, they're called sometimes neurohormones, but they're neurotransmitters and hormone connection. Um, there is some thought even that PMS might be associated to a serotonin deficiency. Right? Serotonin is very calming, and so when you become the raging lunatic, it might be that you don't have enough serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter. Um, so we did look, and, and just to observe the fact that we know hormones and neurotransmitters have a connection again. It's not these independent systems. The body's all working together. It's getting the message from the brain and how to make hormones. So looking at things like healthy um, cortisol levels, which is that stress piece that we talked about earlier, and this is where we see really having an improvement on mood and sleep issues when hormones are balanced. Because that can be where that connection is and why you might feel like you're you know, a little off the deep end, super emotional, not sleeping and this is where that, that hormonal connection can be. Um, we also looked at bone health. Estrogen and progesterone play a role in how your body makes bones. Most people may or may not be aware of this, but again, women tend to see a decrease in bone uh, density postmenopausally because of the connection that estrogen and progesterone play in the creation or the remodeling of bones. So um, estrogen uh, has to do with reducing what's known as osteoclast cells, where progesterone helps to increase with osteoblast cells. Basically, really easy way to remember this, osteoblasts are your building cells. Osteoclast, think of like a claw, it's breaking it down, right? The difference, or the key here is that normally the body has a normal breakdown build, breakdown build, so it stays nice and balanced. When estrogen starts to decrease, progesterone starts to decrease, that balance also becomes compromised, right? So bone integrity starts to be compromised at that point. So keeping estrogen, progesterone in healthy levels definitely can have an impact on bone health. We did measure bone density um, through the T-scores and did see uh, mild improvements with that. They were not statistically highly statistically significant, so not on the really high end when it comes to, um, uh, from a research standpoint. But we also know, it was just brought out earlier before I started, the fact that there's other components to bone, right? So hormones is one aspect, but what about your nutrients? What about your calcium and your D and your K and uh, you know, strength exercise to keep the bones moving and things of that nature? All of that is also still going to play a role, so it's the, the complete picture. Um, we did also measure serum iron levels. Um, for a lot of women, um, changes in hair, skin, nails um, can be associated to low iron levels. We saw an increase in iron levels, which then can contribute, again, hair and skin and nails, also there's a lot of components to it. So it can be iron, it can be diet, it can be um, thyroid function that might impair it essential fatty acids, things of that nature, but knowing we, and we did look at iron, seeing an increase, so we do see improvements in hair, skin, and nails quite commonly with hormones balance out. 
So just kind of a recap. Your feminescence not to harm me for those reproductive years, women with PCOS, PMS, fertility concerns, irregular cycles, your perimenopause women, feminescence not to life, with a big fluctuation, these are your hormones, they are fluctuating, kind of all crazy all over the place. Starting to see some of those common symptoms of hot flashes, night sweats, changes in mood, libido, sleep. And then your feminescence not to pause for your postmenopausal women or women who have had hysterectomies to help support all of the various symptoms um, that can take place, um, as I mentioned, with perimenopause. So before I move into men, because I think I'm doing pretty good on time, any, any particular questions? I'll give it just a couple minutes. Whoever wants to go first. Are you going to cover genetics or anything? I'm not, not today. Just product. Product and the hormones, yeah. Yeah. I'll just put them up for the products. Good question. Yep. Yep. So good question. The question is how long do you need to do it before you see something? So pretty much in, in about a three week time period, most women will see improvements in mood and energy. And then depending on severity, between a one and four month time period for the remaining symptoms. I know that's a big variation, but everybody's level of imbalance is also different. Um, hot flashes, we see improvements in two days to six weeks. Again, when someone's going through it, that's a huge variation, but some women get it right away and others it just takes more time to restore. What about people who don't have any improvement? Any what? What about somebody who doesn't have any improvement? Well, if there's no improvement and they've been working with us, after eight weeks we will give them a full refund. Yep. You will tell them why? Do you have a problem? I am limited in that. I mean, there's, there's obviously, I mean, I can help to a certain degree, but I'm not treating them. So I'm limited in what I can offer. I mean, we know, you know, and what we expect from the product, and that's what we're there to help with as part of the medical team. But I'm not your treating physician or practitioner, so I can, I, there's limited, there's uh, limitations. You were, what was that? If you were. Absolutely, because there's many factors to this. We do provide guidance on food and exercise and in some cases other supplementation or nutrients, but there's a fine line because I'm not a I'm not your treating physician, so I'm limited in what I can offer. Um, so a lot of times when it comes to if you're not exactly getting what you wanted out of it, sometimes there's dosing issues. Inconsistency in dosing will really create some unwanted or, or unpredictable um, effects from what I've seen. So being very consistent to support your hormones on a daily basis is important. Um, sometimes even too, with, with medications, if you're taking it at the same time as certain medications that shouldn't be done, that can create some things that would cause it not to work properly. Um, the beauty with that, and I'm just jumping a little ahead, we have a full medical team to help support that. I mean, so, the reason I asked, one of your slides had all the various enzymes that are involved in hormone metabolization and hydroxylation and um, glucuronidation and what have you. Yep. Um, and I thought you were going to talk about that. I would love to talk about that, but that definitely not, a, I mean, that's a little bit of a, an intensive biochemistry that gets into that, and, I, you know, we've got to advertise that as a class. Sure. That's the direction we're going in. I guess, ultimately, there are certain genetics that people have. Always. This product may not work. But just so you know, just so I clarify, I'm not saying this is 100% for anybody. Sure. By any means. We have 84% success rate, which is really fantastic in the natural world. I'm not saying that this is going to work 100% for everybody. But as a part of the medical team, we're there to help to get you through to make sure. And if you've done everything that we suggested and in eight weeks it didn't work, then we will give you a refund, which is pretty substantial. Yeah. I know I'm the salesperson here. <laughs> But I have to say, I have never heard more no, no, enthusiastic no. response on a male product that's for overall vitality and health than that. I mean, God, they are raving about it. There's about quite, the, about revolution. That, okay, yeah. we haven't even got to that. Right so thanks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 We recommend very minimal four months, ideal four to eight months, but no, you don't have to stop. It's about maintenance. So it's definitely changing the dose to help maintain levels where they are. Yep. 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 
Does it work like you throw a Nexplorin or a Crestor or just what? It does. Um, we definitely make recommendations first and foremost. You always take feminescence away from any other prescription medication, at least an hour away from it. And then I always make sure that you monitor. So if it's for cholesterol, continue to monitor so adjustments can be made if needed. Blood pressure medication, same thing. We see reductions in blood pressure over time, so you want to make sure that you're monitoring so adjustments can be made. Yeah, but always an hour away from medication. It's not all, but it's a nice blanket just to be sure. Did you have another question? Um, you were saying you were trying to so the question is perimenopause and how long that is. It's somewhere between like 7 to 12 years. It's just a stage of life. It's just that transition phase from reproduction into menopause. So it's just a stage of life. Do you suffer with symptoms that whole time? I hope not. Not after today anyway, right? A lot of women do and, and have unnecessarily. And it is because of the fluctuation. Oh. Oh, and that's common. Yeah, no, it's going to fluctuate a lot during perimenopause. So whatever it was two years ago, one year ago, six months ago, may not be the same today. Yeah, so that's why you want to balance. I think I saw somebody back there. What about the postmenopausal weight gain? Yeah. So there's a hormonal connection for sure because everything starts to slow down. So by default, your, your metabolism is slowing down just by aging, period. Right? I mean, our metabolism at 20 is not the same as at 40. So there's a natural progression there. Um, personally, I also find that there's an element of, if we go back to that whole HPA, TG access, right? So over time, especially, and I'm not saying this doesn't apply to men, but for women in particular, you have all these years of, I am mom, I am wife, I am working, I am taking care of the house, I am doing, I am doing, I have this, I'm stressed, I'm not sleeping you know, and all of those things, and eventually the body kind of just says, you know what, yeah. I'm done. Yeah. I'm done with you, and I need to send some stronger messages to you to wake up, right? So there are things like weight gain and, and things like that that can take place. It's just your body trying to scream to you that it needs some attention. Does it work for that symptom? Does it, well, as I said, so we saw weight loss, right. right? It's not a weight loss supplement. We saw weight loss when it's associated to imbalanced hormones. But you've got to look at the whole picture. If you're going to take feminescence and do nothing else, chances are you're not going to see a reduction in weight. There's got to be proper food in there. There's got to be proper exercise, sleep, etc. But it did address cortisol. Correct. Right. Yeah. And the, again, depending on level of adrenal fatigue, additional adrenal support can still very much be needed. I think I saw somebody else. No? Yeah. Uh, what about market pause beyond that period of time? Um, beyond what period of time? Menopause? Postmenopause. Postmenopause is it. That's the last stage of the woman's life. And what uh, what focus need be addressed for hormonal balance? I'm sorry, say that one more time. What, what do you need to do for hormonal balance when you're, you know, past that period of time? But so, so postmenopause or menopause is just another stage of life. So you address it whether you're one year in or 20 years into that stage of life. It's addressing that hormonal imbalance for that stage of life. Just like with harmony, whether you're 20 years old and need reproductive support or you're 40 years old and need it. So it's just that stage and everybody varies. I can tell you I have talked to some very lovely women who called at 80 something years old because they want to have a higher libido. And I love it because that's what's normal, <laughs> right? So they're well into menopause and they are definitely concerned about still maintaining what is considered normal. So let's talk about men for a few minutes. Um, so Revolution Monolibrium is our male product. Um, and despite what a lot of people think, women, are you happy to hear that men have menopause as well? <laughs> it's often called andropause, right? So there is a normal fluctuation for men too. There is going to be a normal decline for men as well. So while this is primarily focusing on those men who are having decreases in hormone levels, so 40 and beyond, we do have application for revolution in their 20s all the way through. 
excuse me, essentially what will happen is the dosing changes. So if somebody's in their 20s, typically hormone levels, testosterone levels are pretty steady, pretty high, um, which is normal, but not, that's not always the case. So it really depends on what's going on with the man, how old they are, and it's a matter of dosing at that point. So dose is just one capsule twice a day. The standard dose is two capsules twice a day. And because there's not um, so many stages of life, we have one easy product for men. We are a little bit more complex ladies, that's all there is to us. <laughs> um, so again, this is using maca, it's our proprietary blend here is maca OG, okay, instead of GO. And this is just um, a, a various blend that is specific towards male health and male um, hormonal health, I should say in particular. Some of the things that we see improvements in um, it, from a fertility standpoint, so sperm production and sperm motility, improvements from prostate, although this is very highly individualized, it's not 100% the only thing you're ever going to do for your prostate, so it needs to be looked at as a whole, and there can still be some other support that may be needed. And then as I said, definitely it's, a, it's more of a dosing um, aspect in terms of taking revolution for, for men. From a, oh, wrong slide. From a fertility perspective, I'm jumping ahead just a little bit. Really important, I think a lot of times women get the short end of the stick with this, like, oh, it's all on you to become pregnant. And oh, it's all on your uterus, <laughs> right? But it's a two-person gig, right? So supporting male hormone health and fertility or conception is just as important as supporting female. So women, if you're here to do that for fertility reasons, then you should be making sure that you know husband, spouse, uh, you know significant other is also doing that as well to produce the best outcomes. Um, really quickly, just to feature one of our other products, as I said, our product line is small for very, um, very purposely, so everything works together really well. One aspect in hormones and how they are metabolized and also detoxified is very important. Um, without getting into it, and I, as I told you, I kind of prep this with, normally this is a three plus hour class for me to provide some more detail with it, but we do detoxify hormones, and we need to, so there's not an excess buildup. So pH quintessence is just a very gentle detoxification support. It is made from um, alfalfa, which is grown in France, and by default then is non-genetically modified because it's not grown here. <laughs> Um, and it's a highly concentrated version, uh, or a highly concentrated um, um, manufacturing process that we do. So essentially you're getting really high doses of greens. So if you've ever done greens drinks or greens powders or green supplements and you have to take like 15 of them, you know, 15 capsules per dose, something like that, this is a three capsule a day dose because of the highly concentrated version that we've done with the alfalfa. Um, we do remove all the um, allergens and phytoestrogens from the plant, so this is um, pretty safe for just about everybody, unless you have a very severe, obviously, alfalfa allergy, and in some cases, grass allergies. Um, other than that, this is a nice way to just help support the natural detoxification process. There's my fertility slide. So for when, men and women, feminescence for women, revolution for men, and then adding in some detox support from a fertility aspect. Can you take that detox and not run it alongside the other one? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. So it won't interfere with them? No, nope, not at all. Yep. No, nope. this is all works together. So how does it work? How does it work? The detox. The, the detox. Yeah. Well, so without, with, uh, as a basic overview, just like your greens are beneficial, greens are beneficial to help with estrogen metabolism. So if you think about things like, um, cruciferous vegetables that help to support the pathways for, for correct, like them. So it's getting into the detoxification pathways, which, like I say, that's more than what we're covering in today's class. So. Um, and then sleep. So this goes back to, needless to say, if anybody's ever been sleep deprived, do you get moody? Do you feel agitated? Yeah. And hungry. See there, right? And hungry. Right? Your body's trying to still use the calories when you should be sleeping. I mean, you still use calories then, but just not as much. So sleep can have a very big impact on the overall hormonal picture. And if you're not sleeping and you feel those effects, you know it. 
I can tell you I'm a sleeper, and one night I'm not sleeping, I'm like, I don't know how any of y'all people do this <laughs> without sleeping, because I feel like absolute, you know, muddled, you know, totally muddled in my head, not concentrating well, and a whole host of other things just off one bad night. So we use, um, we have two different products, um, both are herbitonin. As was mentioned, this is the only plant-based melatonin on the market. So your other melatonins are synthetic. Um, so really important is that's one key piece to it. The other key piece is the dosing aspect. So everybody has heard of melatonin, I'm assuming, in some fashion, right? And you see doses from like, well, now you see it in 0.3, but we see doses in one milligram, three, five, 10, 20, 10, you've seen, right? And it, we tend to have this concept in our head like, well, if one didn't work, three must be better. Oh, three didn't work, five must be better. Five didn't work, let me try the 10. I'm still not sleeping, melatonin doesn't work. No. <laughs> so that's not how this works. The body actually makes melatonin naturally in about 0.2 to 0.8 milligrams per day. It's part of your normal circadian rhythm. So, you know, we should have higher energy in the morning and naturally come down, and when it gets dark out, melatonin production begins in about 0.2 to 0.8. You're talking about an ideal form. Correct. But the gut makes 400 times as much melatonin. Right, because there's antioxidant value too. We're talking yes. from a sleep perspective. Yep. So, so the body naturally producing this to create a restful night's sleep. Right, so really important. If you're taking five milligrams, chances are you're gonna wake up groggy. You might fall asleep for a little bit, but then wake up and have like the melatonin hangover, they often call it where you feel kind of just like that, like a hangover, you feel groggy and not with it. Um, so the point three dosing is um, the ideal dose to start off with. In some cases, some people will increase where they're taking two, so it's a point um, six milligram, but for your everyday dosing, point three milligrams is pretty much all most people need. Yes? If you're taking this at some point, does your body balance out itself naturally, or do you have to so the question is, does the body eventually balance out naturally or do you continue? Right. It varies. Right. It varies and I think a lot of that depends on how long you may have been deprived. So it depends. Some people use it occasionally, some people use it every day as their only way of sleeping. Um, so it, it does It does depend. Do you think um, if your body is not able to produce melatonin, then you're dependent in that fashion. But does it, does it do anything to inhibit the body from? No. Does the body gets sloppy and lazy? No, <laughs> no, it does not. Melatonin? It does not. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's absolutely. That's what it is. It's a negative. Everything here is, uh, works off a negative feedback loop, which is basically think about your thermometer. You know, if you, if you set it at 70, once it gets to 70, it will turn off automatically. Right. Right? So that is the basic concept of that negative feedback. You might get into that habit by not following good sleep-related practices, not sleeping in a dark room, watching TV until right. 11 o'clock, or right. exposing yourself to um, the blue light spectrum. Yep, so I'm getting to that. that. Hang with me. I'm getting to that. Yeah. yeah, there is the sleep aspect that, of course, there's the hormone aspect to it, but there's a lot of other factors, as he was just mentioning. I mean, if you are playing with your iPhone and iPad and watching TV in bright light at midnight, guess what? Your body is not getting that message of it's time for sleep, right? This is becoming a big problem, especially now that a new study just came out with preschoolers because parents are pacifying their kids with an iPhone instead of reading a book to them. And so guess what? Now the preschoolers aren't sleeping. Like kids are the best sleepers on the planet. Are you kidding me? We're interfering with this natural production. So there are these outside factors. And by all means, we always suggest that you look at those factors too. Because this is going to work, but not necessarily if you're up with blue light in your face all the time and you just drank a bucket of caffeine beforehand, <laughs> you know, things of that nature. So it is looking at the overall big picture. Um, we do also have another dose which is designed, the three milligram dose is designed for shift work and jet lag. So this is more short term use. So if you know you're traveling, grab a travel pack, take it with you to help from the jet lag perspective. And if you are doing night work or shift work, I should say, then the higher dose is typically needed. But for everyday sleep, the lower dose is appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. 
it doesn't stop our bodies from still producing melatonin, like some of the synthetic right. melatonin. Just to go back, because I did kind of, I mean, this is like, this is a vision of it. Basically, from the synthetic version, um, the two most common places that melatonin comes from is typically um, pigs or cows from their pineal gland, or it's made from like some petroleum source. Yeah, right? Gross. Right? You don't necessarily know that. So, so herbatonin is coming from plants. It's the, the plant's natural or, or bioidentical hormones that, that is found naturally in plants. Okay, so the other thing, and this is where, like I said, we could go on and on and on. You can't do any of this and then forget about the diet. Like, you don't take feminescence or revolution, pH contestants, and go to McDonald's. Not going to happen, right? Like, it's about the whole lifestyle piece. So the diet is very important. There are foods that are much more beneficial to hormone balancing than others, if you will. For instance, cruciferous vegetables help in aiding and detoxifying the body. So you will metabolize things like estrogen more effectively. Fat and protein. A lot of people are afraid of fat, although we're getting better with it. But fat and protein are the backbones to your hormones. If you're not getting enough of those, you're not giving the nutrients that your body needs to even make those hormones properly. So you've got to have fat and protein in your diet. And usually a pretty significant amount. So a paleo style diet is pretty nice for hormones. Uh, it's not the only option out there, but it does help to eliminate a lot of the common food triggers. Um, you know, dairy and gluten are big problems for a lot of people. It's not just hype. They're big problems for a lot of people. Um, but by default, when you get rid of some of those, you go towards fat, protein, and vegetables. And we're all not getting enough of those on a regular basis. Can't forget about the exercise, but this is a piece where you've got to do it appropriately and very much customize it for you. Just because CrossFit and high intensity interval training is the new it thing, doesn't mean it's good for you. And it can actually be a stress to your body. If your adrenals are fatigued in any way, shape, or form, those type of workouts are going to be disastrous for you. Okay, I promise. And I get people all the time, I'm doing this, I'm doing it six days a week and I'm still not losing weight. Right, because now your body is stressed out even more from what you're asking of it. So, finding a program that's right for you. Good old walking is still a great way to exercise. <laughs> right? Get out and walk, get your Fitbit, get whatever little device you want, get 10,000 plus steps in, make it work, and just be more active. Um, same thing too, this takes into the whole lifestyle aspect of the fact that many of us sit all day long. I am one, I have an office, I sit, however I went and got a, I, was, I spent a little money on it, but I got a walking treadmill desk so I can walk while I talk to people. It was the best thing on the planet. I added like four to five miles a day on top of what I already did that I normally would have been sitting. I get it's not for everybody. It works for me. It works for my office. So it's, it's, it's a good thing. Um, the other aspect is the stress management. This is a whole class, right? <laughs> stress management. You're not going, I'm, by all means, I recognize and understand you're not going to eliminate it. But how we respond to stress can change. The thing is, everybody has it ingrained in them already. If somebody makes you mad, before you can even think, you have your reaction, right? Is in there? Somebody makes you mad, you already know. And then you might go like, oh boy, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have said that, I wish I didn't do this, right? And the brain had a little time to catch up and go, that wasn't the right approach. So really from a stress management standpoint, this takes time. And it takes a regular, consistent practice. So you can learn how to deal with it better. Not going to eliminate it, although some things you may need to, right? Some people are in very toxic relationships, jobs, etc. And sometimes you need to purge and, and maybe move on to something else. Um, but a lot of times it's just figuring out how to, how to work with it. And then another really important piece is don't underestimate what your prescriptions might be doing to your hormones, right? There are a lot of side effects to prescriptions that create symptoms like hot flashes, mood swings, changes in sleep, weight gain, right? T just take a peek and know so you're well informed. I'm not saying that you need to go on and stop it by any means. You've got to talk to your doctor about that. But be aware of what might be causing the symptoms because it may be hormonal, but it may be also a symptom of a prescription that you're on. 
So, we have a few minutes for questions. I did put contact information up there, just so you know we have, as I mentioned, a medical team that answers questions for consumers, for the stores, for doctors, and that's what we're there for. We're there to help with those same questions. Limited, as I had mentioned, in terms of all kinds of advice, we can give some general guidance um, to, to help you with, with any concerns there. Um, so while we have just a couple minutes anyway, I'll take a few more questions. Yeah. I apologize, you may have covered this while I was out, but I'm on a thyroid medication now. So if I take this, then this muckle Yep. It's, and it's an adaptogenic, it's, it's not necessarily going to interfere with my thyroid test. It will just work so, around it. Yeah, so here's the thing with, with all medications, as a general rule, just take it an hour away from any medication. Very particular with thyroid medication, because thyroid medication should be taken away from everything, at least an hour away from everything. Um, pardon? Yeah, oh no, that's okay. Really? So you take yeah. it in the morning and then just. An you hour should wait an hour before you do anything. Eat, drink coffee, anything. For sure. Yeah, I'm if what? You have several of them? Well, that's where I can help you work on that. It right. depends. I mean, a lot of times there's many prescriptions that are taken together. Right. But from a feminescent standpoint, you do want to take it an hour away from that thyroid medication. And then again, you monitor. Because this is working that HPA TG access. So the thyroid can be very positively influenced and start to produce hormones properly without the use of prescription. So you need to monitor your thyroid levels and make adjustments in dosing of your prescription as needed. So that being said, is this something that could be done with the weight You've got to talk to your doctor about it. I mean, um, it has that potential. Yes, it does. But you've got to monitor your levels and, and work with your doctor on them. Right. Yeah. Do you use iodine or anything for any of these? It's very, it's very customized. It depends on what's going on with the thyroid. If you have Hashimoto's iodine, might not be a good choice. Right. So you've got to really know what's going on with the thyroid. And when you say you work with us, I mean, you're obviously in New York, is this online? Work, you, um, you have email and phone access to the whole medical team. Yep. Right. Yep. Question? I thought I saw someone know. Even vitamins and supplements, you can get the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. As a general, right, as a general rule of thumb, I, I, I've been in this industry for a while, and the, the general rule is always, you've got to give everything at least 12 weeks. The body takes time, right? So while you can notice things beforehand, to really make impacts on a cellular level, the body needs time. So, and this is no different. I just purchased the point three. Okay. So it's anywhere from 30 to 120 minutes before bed. So big range. Start off with 30 minutes, and if that's not doing the trick after three to five days, try an hour before. And give it a three to five day window from there. Is feminescence a good postnatal? Like, is that okay to take it as a postnatal, like, while you're still nursing? Oh, good question. So feminescence um, should not be used while nursing. Okay. Um, there is potential of um, interfering with milk supply. Okay. So for a lot of women, then it becomes a you know an issue of well you know I'm only nursing one time a day now or infrequently, so I'm willing to do this knowing that that's a risk because I've really got to get this symptom under control. But um, we don't recommend it during during breastfeeding. Okay. Oh, so the question is on melatonin with a, a, with anybody, in particular a 12-year-old. We don't recommend this as the first choice for any children. We recommend the lifestyle things first. Yeah, you. I mean, it, there is a lot of studies around melatonin in children. However, there's a big lifestyle piece there that needs to be basically addressed first before jumping to this. Hey, Kim, I just want to say, uh, I think we talked about it on the show that uh, Chris Killam, if anyone knows who he is, is uh, he's called the Medical Explorer. He's uh, world-renowned. He's written a lot of books. And he did a video of his trip to Peru. 
and just lived with the people there for a while. And uh, it was fascinating because they had a maca festival. So they had liquor made out of maca. They had pancakes made out of maca. <laughs> and you went, he showed it in the video, a booth to booth, something made it from maca. But the point he was making, and he, he also wrote a lot of books on you know, libido and things like that, and sexual <coughs> health, how the people in their 80s and 90s enjoy a very healthy sex life and are also very productive at that age. This is kind of like their main food up there. And this, this plant only grows in that, that altitude, so it, it's such a hearty thing. Yeah, so it's, of, it's really the, amazing. One of the neat things about the, um, the, the research behind it, um, even so much as seeing the differences in the elevation, so much as, I, I will tell you, our CEO, I, I love him to death, but he is the most detailed person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> Where he has actually studied maca in the sense of, even so much as to the lunar phases. How does it grow with the lunar phases and what active constituents come out as a result of the lunar phases? Okay, he didn't mess around here. So we're seeing how all of this stuff makes a difference. So the elevation and the soil quality and things of, of that nature really impact then what active constituent you're able to get from the maca. So um, this is where it goes back to, it's not all created the same. And now there's many sources, China has gotten on the maca bandwagon and there's a lot of maca coming from China um, that there's, <laughs> she goes, mm. <laughs> there, yeah, oh, we're not feeling that too much. <laughs> But yeah, they're they're on the Maka bandwagon in China. Now, China too, so. <laughs> not sure how that's going to turn out, considering what we know about this brand. <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe something China. 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 Maybe something Absolutely. If you just think about, and as she was saying, the nutrient value to any food. You know, the soil plays such a big a big role in it, the environment, the atmosphere in which food is grown. If you've all grown your own tomatoes, you know how very different it is than the one you get at the grocery store that was picked when it was green and has no flavor, right? I mean, it's all, all of those things do make a difference, for sure. And this is, is no different. I think I saw somebody's hand. How much is the melatonin? Uh, I'm sorry? How much is the melatonin? Um, the the melatonin. The store could tell you, I have no uh, idea. The 90, <laughs> the 90 I answer all the technical questions. I have no idea pricing. It's around $13. About $13. $13. Yeah, but there's 90 capsules in the box. That's going to last a while. You can't compare it to a 30 capsule. Yeah. Of it's going to be a little bit Yeah. So that's uh, basically a three month supply that you're getting. Like, you get that box, you don't think you're taking any capsules. Yeah. And one of the things, too, that um, there, you see everything in a box. One of the things um, that's, that's pretty unique is we blister pack everything. And we do that um, for a quality purpose, for quality purposes. But one of them in particular, maca is very fragile. So it is, it really can be affected by heat and moisture. So the blister packs really help to preserve its, a, its, its integrity, essentially. Um, when left out in, you know, a bag or a container or things like that, it can lose between 50 to 60 percent of the active constituents because of the exposure to heat and moisture and air. So the blister packs, I mean, we, we do it not just because they look nice, but we do it for quality reasons, too. And it makes it really easy because you're taking this a couple times a day. It's easy to put a blister pack in your purse and go, or leave one at the office and go. You don't have to carry a big bottle around both places. 